Hi, I'm Elliot Frisbee from Monkey Audiobooks. I'm here with Mike Reed. We have just finished completing the audiobook of one of his books, which is fantastic, which is Forever England, The Life of Rupert Brooke. Um, this is a big interest to me because one of my favourite poems of all time is The Soldier. So, Mike, I have to ask, why Rupert Brooke? I had a book of uh, Brooks' poems when I was a kid, and I was intrigued by the fact that he looked very modern compared to everyone else. Everyone else looked Edwardian as they were, the glasses, the hair. Brooke looked like he belonged in the 1960s or 1970s. I was quite intrigued by that, and then found that uh, he and his gang used to go and camp where you had to be chaperoned before they'd play guitar, read poetry. So they were really what the 60s became in a way. Um, they, they, and it was only the First World War and then the austerity of the 20s, the political 30s, and then another war. So it was only really the austerity of the 50s again until the 1960s that what they were, he and his circle of friends, were able to be what they were about to become in the Edwardian period, that last golden Edwardian summer. It, it didn't actually break through until the 1960s. So that rather intrigued me, along of course with, with his poetry. Well, what amazed me when we were recording this down was how much research you had to put into this book. I mean, it must yeah. have taken you travelling. I mean, how long did it take you to write? Uh, I don't know, because I'm always doing other things at the same time. But I travel all over the country, over Scotland, Wales and England. Uh, and it was great, because it's a bit like being a literary detective. And that's why I like, you know, you yeah. turn up um, somewhere and you sleuth around and you think, Eureka, I've got it, I've found it out. This. And so you can write with a first-hand experience. You're not like doing, some, doing it with a sort of trellis hand, you know, a d distant thing. Uh, you know, you've been there, you've seen it, you've actually touched it, you've walked in the footsteps. So you have a better feel of it, really. I think in, in writing poetry as well, it gives you some sort of uh, aid into that. But it, it was a very complex character. And sometimes, you, you, whenever you're writing about somebody, you feel that you're there with them, that you know them very, very well. You're part of the gang, you're walking with them, you're running with them. So I think that that's something that you actually feel, you feel the person you're writing about has become a friend. Oh, that's that, yeah, I can see that. But you must have, whenever you went on um, doing your research on, on the book itself, you must have some idea of what you're going to find. Did you ever go somewhere and just come away with something completely different that you wasn't expecting? Um, yeah, there are certain things. I mean, when I went to the house of Peter Ward, I only met three people on, on my travels that had met Rook as young children, because uh, so he died in 1915. Uh, one of them was Peter Ward, a friend of Dudley Ward, to whom Brooke entrusted a lot of his letters and stuff to sort out some of the business that he didn't want his mother to know about. Um, and Peter, the second time I went to see him, he brought down a box. He said, well, I've got a box in the attic somewhere. And he brought down a box full of photographs that Brooke took in the South Seas. I mean, hundreds and hundreds all screwed up, but of course, that was put on hold because of the war. And nobody worried about, let's go and get these photographs printed up and have a look at them. So they all lay in a box. And I got them all out, and there were so many of them, and I thought, I don't know why I'm getting them all out. And at the bottom were some sheets of paper. And one was a letter. And it was a letter exploring the fact that Brooke had had a child in the South Seas. And, and one thing led to another, and I talked to the... Uh, I, I actually hired a private detective in Tahiti to find some stuff out for me. You actually talk, hired a... Yeah. Amazing. And I, um, I spoke at length with the daughter of Norman Hall. He was the producer of the original Mutiny on the Bounty with Charles Lawton. Um, and she knew Brooke's daughter, so then I got a flu her, I got a photograph. And uh, through the Hastings family, Lord Hastings and what have you. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of research uh, to find out and then get a photograph of, of Brooke's daughter as well. So it was, uh, it was exceptional. When you find something, you think, hang on, wait a minute. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to venture into this and see. And, and in it, I, I, I tried to get hold of, uh, like, our man in Tahiti. Um, because I thought we must have a, a diplomat out there. He must have an ambassador. And I phoned the foreign office. They said, no, we don't have anyone out there. And I found the guy. And he said, I think they've forgotten about me. They don't <laughs> realise I'm still here. I said, well, as long as they're still paying you, that's all right. Absolutely. Now, I got a few surprises in here, things I wasn't expecting um, uh, to hear at all. For the, for the people who are going to download this, and I strongly recommend it, because this it really is a fantastic book. Um, I concur. What, <laughs> what, what can people expect from Forever England? I think you get probably that, that balanced view, say that, that after, um, after his death, he was eulogised, everyone sung his praises, he was the first soldier poet since Philip Sidney in the 1500s, um, 
just as he was dying, Dean Ingred, the soldier at St. Paul's, it was the equivalent of having a number one uh, when you die. So suddenly everyone was eulogising about him and only his mother, as mothers do, saying, look, come on, he was just, a, he was a young boy. You know, don't, don't elevate him, don't canonise him. He's not a saint uh, and never was. Clearly, judging by his love life, he wasn't. Um, but you get the eulogies, and then, like with all these things, you get the iconoclasts that come out and say, actually, let's unpick all this. He wasn't like that at all. He was just this, this, this. So then the pendulum swings the other way. And then somebody like me comes along to write a biography that actually makes a balanced view of it. That stops the pendulum swinging this way, that way. That actually, let it come to a standstill in the middle and let's look at it properly. Absolutely. Well, Forever England, um, it'll be... Available mid-March, um, but official release date will be on St George's Day. And it's a fantastic book, written, written by Mike Reed, narrated by Mike Reed as well. And it was an absolute pleasure recording this book with you. Fantastic, it was great fun. It's always, uh, always interesting recording a, a, a talking book, because you're trying to get all the inflections right and do portray the different people, but in a very slight accent, but not so much that it's over the top. You've got to portray what people are saying, so that people go, oh, that's so-and-so talking. Is giving you a little insight on how he's read the book there, but he did absolutely superbly as you always do. So that's Forever England, The Life of Rupert Brooke, released by Monkey Audio Books on St George's Day. I can't recommend it highly enough, to be honest. <laughs> it's an impartial, unbiased view. Absolutely. Go and get it. Hi, it's me again. I was just packing away and I was having a chat with Mike here before he shoots off and play tennis. And um, he said something really quite interesting, which I just wanted to share with you about the book um, which Rupert Brooke had with him um, on the day he died. And also, I'll just mention the word hair. And if, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that, I think it's interesting. Yeah, when we were reading it, I was, I was mentioning that Brooke took one book with him to Gallipoli. Uh, he and his friends were known as the Latin table on board the ship because they were all extremely bright lads. And he took Charles Eliot's Turkey in Europe because obviously he wanted to read about the state of things, the Balkans, how things were shaping up, because they were going to be part of it, they were part of uh, making history. So the only book uh, that he took with him is the only book that he signed uh, with his rank on, Sub Lieutenant Rupert Brook, February 1915. The only one? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's the only book he signed as Sub Lieutenant Rupert Brook. And he had it with him uh, when he died. And I have the book, I have that actual book. Can um, I ask how, how you acquired it? Uh, yeah, it was brought to my attention by a bookseller in London, and I think an American university were trying to get hold of it as well. And I thought, oh, everything goes to America and then you can't get at it. And I sort of foolishly, I think I probably telephoned my bank manager, what I was going to do. And he said, nothing to do with me, Governor. Um, uh, so anyway, I bought it. And at an auction, where I went with Robin Calvin, who owned the orchard where Brooke lived for quite a few years, um, Robin and I bid on various things, and he bought a diary, and I bought some other stuff, and what have you. And in the package that I got was a little brown leather case that opened up, and there's a gold uh, rim inside with glass in the middle, and Rupert Brooks' hair, lock of Rupert Brooks' hair, the only earthly remains. I think Eddie Marsh had it on his desk, and it says RB, and it's engraved RB on the inside as well. So Can I ask, without going into too much detail, <coughs> excuse me, is this the same hair? that it's made reference in the book. Yes. Yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. In the yeah. last couple of in the last couple of chapters, that that I think that's amazing that you've got that. Yeah, well I mean Eddie Marsh, who was sort of Churchill's right hand man already when he's uh, the Admiralty, uh, went out to Brooke's mother and they were going through stuff and there was a, this lock of hair. So he obviously had it put in this little glass case, in a leather case, and had it on his desk as a reminder of Brooke. So I think his, his secretary or his PA had it and then let it go and it turned up and I have it along with the book. That is amazing. Yeah. That, that genuinely is amazing. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Mike. Um, right, I'm going to let you go now and you can go and play some tennis. Thank you very much. Um, so that's Forever England. It will be available mid-March, um, but official release date will be on St George's Day.